much for coming along once again. This evening we're going to look at a uh, very important problem, growing problem, a growing problem in several respects in that it's becoming more and more important, but it's based on something that uh, looks a little counterintuitive, namely <laughs> it's based on the notion that the humans are becoming marginalized in the earth system. Now by that I don't mean that we're becoming less important, <laughs> um, meaning simply that in effect we're moving to the margins of every continent on earth. And it's going to be an increasing problem in the decades ahead, especially an environmental justice problem as well as just plain a survival problem. So I'm entitling it uh, Environmental Justice and Survival on the Margins, Protecting the World's Coastal <coughs> Ecosystems. You can see what's meant by marginalization by looking at a map of where shoreline degradation is occurring and coastal populations are concentrated. <coughs> this isn't very complicated, it's just a demographic trend humans are moving to the margins of continents. And it's no surprise that shoreline degradation follows rather quickly after that movement takes place, especially since population has grown so quickly in the last few decades. By few decades I mean in effect since I was born. Since I was born, global population has tripled. I was born in 1946 and basically you can put any two lines on the map you want or here on the graph and indicate how much the global population has grown during that time of interval. And in the interval of my lifetime, human population has tripled. This is really quite extraordinary in itself. It's never happened before in human history. And it will not happen again. It cannot happen again. It can't go from 7.5 billion to over 22 billion people on the Earth's surface. There isn't enough <clears throat> land to produce food, water to sustain it, and space to live upon. Basically, it won't happen again. The only time in human history. But not only has the growth been rapid, there's been a rapid relocation of that population on the Earth's surface. Urbanization, basically, rapid and massive urbanization of the human population has taken place, so much so that the estimate is that by the year 2050, 66 percent of the human population is going to be living in cities. Take a look. Rapid urbanization is reshaping the global development landscape. By 2050, 66% of the global population is expected to live in urban areas, with 90% of urban growth happening in developing countries. 90% of urban growth expected to happen in the global south. And those cities are by and large post-Columbian cities, cities put in place since Columbus quote-unquote discovered the New World and found the New World. He didn't find it because it wasn't lost, but in fact the entire human apparatus of economic interaction has changed since 1492 as people have been focused on transoceanic trade. In addition, from the continents there's been a huge extraordinary transformation. The largest internal migration in human history has just taken place within our lifetimes. Take a look. Since 1978, China has experienced the largest internal migration in human history. Nearly 160 million people, that's almost 12 percent of today's population, have left rural areas to seek work in the cities. 160 million people have left rural areas in the continent to move for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part to coastal cities. Why? 
The motivation to move was obvious. In 1978, everyone was poor, and rural incomes were less than 40% of urban ones. Suddenly, communist China threw open its doors, and factories appeared in coastal towns, where farmers could make more money in a month than in a year growing rice. Okay, the factories appeared in coastal towns. Why? Well, very simply because that's where you could trade internationally for what was being developed in those towns, in those factories, right? So population moves from the interior to the coastal cities to engage in manufacture uh, because the incomes are 12 times that per month of those in the rural areas. Take a look. Migrants moved from the poorest inland provinces such as Guizhou, Sichuan and Anhui. In 1980, farmers here lived on less than $2 a day. According to Cam Wing Chan at the University of Washington, more than 10 million workers migrated out of their home province between 1990 and 1995. Another 32 million migrated from 1995 to 2000, and yet another 38 million over the next five years. By 2011, nearly 160 million rural Chinese were working far from home. Okay, now you saw the movement of those arrows largely to these coastal areas. Now this is very interesting because, okay, human population is growing, cities are accounting for more and more of that, and more and more of the cities are on coasts. China's coastal migration is dramatic, but it's not unique. Rather, it's typical of the global south. Most of the growth of urban areas is along coastlines in the global south. Now this is leading to extraordinary pressure and what some call a wake-up call. Coastal zones and urbanization, a wake-up call has been the title of a recent report given a summary for decision makers um, and a look at what's coming to coastal regions is pretty staggering. It's worth getting all of these reports through the Transition Studies website and looking at them in detail because we're in for some fairly dramatic changes. While coastal zones may seem immediately profitable, they are in fact inherently unstable particularly with sea level rise global, globally. Globally, sea level is rising, and information like this should sober you up very quickly. In Japan, a top official with the Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, says he wants to dump more than 700,000 tons of contaminated water from Fukushima's nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean. Local fishermen are protesting against the plan, saying dumping more radioactive waste into the water will imperil the fishing industry. The water is contaminated with tritium, which can cause cancer when ingested in high concentrations. Right. But notice it's the fishing populations, the fishermen, who are objecting to this. Because they're the ones that first see it in the fish. People who eat the fish, people who are away from the coast, people who are involved less directly aren't objecting yet. But we're dealing with the ocean as if it were a dump, a sewer, a waste, infinite waste uh, source which we can just dump radioactivity into. That's not the case. For this reason, there's been an international affairs conference recently, just this last week actually, it's a family conference put together on Star Island in New Hampshire. If you haven't been out to one of these, you ought to get to one at some point. This one took place from the 22nd to the 29th on Star Island, and they looked this year particularly at the problems of oceans. The World Oceans Protecting an International Resource. They have an international conference center out there on the island, Star Island, and it's really quite an experience to go through it for a week and study and learn from visiting experts about what's happening on a global basis. Their conference material put out the information quite clearly. Oceans, they argued, are the lifeblood of Earth 
and humankind. They flow over nearly three quarters of our planet and hold 97% of the world's, the planet's, water. They produce more than half of the oxygen in the atmosphere and absorb the most carbon from it. It's not terrestrial plants, but it's oceanic plankton that is absorbing the carbon. Then, as they point out, unfortunately our oceans are seriously threatened. And that's what they studied for the week out there at this International Conference Center. It's staggering, but on an island you get a very quick sense of what's problematic around the coastlines. Foodstuffs have to be imported. Everything, in a sense, is a metaphor for the Earth as a whole. Earth Island, Star Island. Well, at the conference there was a very interesting array of people, including people like Heidi Weisgall, who are professional scientists, but who work with lawyers. So that kind of intergroup conversation was going on constantly out there, and it's the kind of uh, citizen-scientist alliance that's starting to emerge around the world. She came and gave the benefit of some of her insights about how we should look at coastal regions. Take a look. One of the things that we need to do as a society, those of us who live in the United States, is to think more carefully about the different impacts of climate change along our coastlines, and not just in the United States where we're already seeing the impacts of, co of climate change happen, um, but in other places around the world. So communities that are not just um, experiencing things like nuisance flooding or sunny day flooding, we do in some parts of the country, but really much more serious impacts like the complete inability to live where we once lived, the people's inability to go fishing in the same places, the threats that they face from increased pollution in the near shore environment because there's much more runoff from the increased storminess and there's a lack of infrastructure to keep people safe and to keep the waters clean. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about how we do this, how we bring these ideas of environmental justice to um, coastal communities around the world. And one of the things I think we need to be doing, one of the, one of the steps I hope that we can take, is to help put more tools in the hands of communities so that they can, for example, claim the rights of an area where they've lived for generations or, they can, or a place that they use um, on a repeated basis. And so corporations and governments can't come in and say, actually, that's our land and we're going to um, appropriate it from this. Right. I mean, corporations and governments are starting to say, listen, we're going to take over your land on the coast. And she points out we need to think more carefully about the different impacts of climate change on these areas and especially the local populations. Governments around the world need to protect their coastal populations, not just push them aside. They've been there for hundreds of years and they know, in fact, how to interact with the oceans more sustainably than the populations from the interior who are recently arrived. But governments do not always act to protect the rights of local populations. And she's full of examples of how this has gone awry in the past, especially in the wake of climate disasters or geologic disasters like earthquakes. Take a look. It's a really good example of this in India. After the tsunami in 2004, um, on the east coast of, of India, um, the whole community, Chennai, and the whole uh, coastline of Tamil Nadu, the state of Tamil Nadu, was hit very badly. And the government came in and said, well, uh, this is dangerous for you to be living within the coastal zone. And actually, in India, the regulations about what the coastal zone are very strict and very well regulated. And so the government rightly said, this is not a safe place for you to be living, so we're going to move you behind this line, this coastal zone line. And, um, and so all of the uh, people said, okay, we understand, it's not safe, we're going to move, um, and so they all moved. The government's doing a great job, taking care of the people, and um, and, uh, and we were able to, um, and then what happened was that the community uh, watched as the government of India went back to the coastal, the prime coastal real estate, and sold it to the highest bidder. 
So all these commercial developers came in, all these private organizations came in, and um, and they essentially took the um, the land back. And so the communities who had traditionally lived there and owned that land um, were no longer able to effectively use it. And they stood behind the line of the most safe zone that the government had set up for them and watched other people get profit and get access to the zones that they had been living in. So we want to avoid that kind of um, that kind of social and environmental injustice. And so we're doing that by trying to help communities gather the tools that they need to say, we live here, we have a right to be here, we didn't cause the climate change problem, and we need support in helping to stop it and not be affected by it. Right. Okay. Defending people where they are with the tools of lawyers and as a scientist, she's the chief scientist looking into this. Coastal aquaculture is a good example of another series of problems that can be caused in this regard. Often governments want to promote development along the coast and they do so by developing projects. In fact, they're getting to be quite excited about this around the world and held a World Aquaculture Conference down in South Africa earlier this summer. As it, some of the advertising at it said, unlocking the ocean's economy through aquaculture. But these need to be looked at for their scientific validity and viability and their environmental justice impact. Take a look at the promotional material though. It's amazing. As global fish stocks continue to deplete worldwide, aquaculture has become increasingly important as an environmentally sustainable way to meet global demand for fish products. That's an unchallenged consensus among delegates at this year's World Aquaculture Conference, where Africa has taken an increasingly more proactive role in adopting the practice. An increasingly more active role, but are the local populations being consulted? Well, this is the kind of thing that Heidi discussed as a staff scientist for Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide, known as elaw.org, and gave a very good paper on resource protection and environmental justice in the era of coastal climate change. It was written up in their lo local uh, newsletter, but she emphasized that development projects in agriculture, aquaculture need to be founded on reliable science if they're going to be sustainable and address the needs of local populations. She's been doing this around the world in different spots, including most recently in Morocco where she was interviewed. Take a look. Representing the Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide, which works with international um, environmental lawyers in their countries around the world to better protect the environment and to work with the local communities to help keep their environments safe and to help them with their local economies. Well, that's the goal. Keep the environment safe and help them with their local economies. As she points out as a scientist, you can do this correctly or you can make huge mistakes at it. We have experience working with many countries about aquaculture and um, we are, this is our first time working in Morocco so it's a wonderful opportunity and I was so pleased to, yesterday to be able to go to the fields and to see the a good example of aquaculture being done here. So because we work on sustainability and environmental protection and because of my expertise as a marine ecologist we know, so we have some sense of, okay, what does it mean to be sustainable? What does it mean to do environmental sustainability to keep that idea in mind really? when we are producing new species because it's you can do aquaculture in a bad way you know you can make a lot of mistakes you can have a huge negative effect on the environment and once the environment is ruined it hurts everybody in the community because they also cannot use it and, and it affects the the quality of the species that they can sell so we are thinking okay what are the principles of sustainability that's what I presented today at the conference what are the ten things that we should keep in mind in order to be able to protect the environment but also give, make sure that the local community has the, the power to make the decisions and to uh, receive the economic benefits of developing aquaculture. Well, the interview went on in Arabic, but um, she doesn't speak Arabic, so she, in fact, 
stopped being translated, but she had an amazing impact there in Morocco, uh, suggesting in effect that they go forward with their project, but think about the sustainability of it. And she emphasized in that conference and has since the ten principles of sustainability in aquaculture. Cultivate native species, no genetically modified organisms, no migratory species. Capture or raise juveniles, fly or spat, sustainably. You've got to be very careful that you're getting the early fish in a sustainable manner and not one that will kill the wild fish populations. Do not use protein to make protein. Don't feed fish to fish, which is one of the sources of food for the fish farms. Use renewable energy to run the system. That's a kind of no-brainer, you would think, but it's absolutely crucial to realize that you can't subsidize it with fossil fuel energy. You've got to be using solar energy to make this thing work. Prohibit the additions of growth hormones, antibiotics, and dyes. Don't cut into non-renewables and poisonous material in the fish or shellfish that you're producing. Close the food and effluent cycles. No pollution. Now, this is hard to do in the open ocean with pens of salmon, but there are proposals to bring fish aquaculture programs on shore in big tanks. There you can control the pollution and its movement much more easily than out in the ocean itself. Match the habitat with the biological needs of the species. Don't try to grow species that don't, in effect, thrive in the environment that you're working in. Confirm that the area has not been appropriated from others. Don't assume in your project that because you're well capitalized you can just take over the land of people who have been traditional inhabitants. Do not degrade the selected habitat to accommodate the project. You can't ruin everything else there just for the purposes of your profit-making venture. Maintain realistic densities to reduce disease and parasites. It does no good to produce fish if they become diseased as they were in other CAFOs, that is, concentrated agriculture or agriculture feed operations on land. This is where beef and pork and chickens get ill and the response has been to use antibiotics, creating greater and greater forms of resistant disease. Now these are the efforts that show clearly we need urgently this kind of citizen science alliance around the world to work together to devise a transition to a sustainable future. Not just a profitable moment for those who can grab coastal lands, but a sustainable future. And it's crucial that we do it in a citizen science alliance.
looking for 